Hi everyone. All right, continuing the series of fixing various gauge problems on your 94 through 96 Chevy Caprice or 95 and 94 Impala SS. Uh, I'm going to show you how to disassemble the dash, uh, the cluster to get access to the cluster and the gauges is without needing to take the entire dash, lower dash panel apart. Uh, this procedure is a little bit easier. Um, there's more screws to remove, but in the end, it's actually easier. And I'll explain why that's easier as we go along. You have to also bear with me. The lighting is bad in here. Anybody who's ever worked on the inside of a car and tried to videotape it will understand that uh, there's a lot of weird lighting reflections and shadows and angles you got to deal with, and it's just not ideal. But I'm trying my best here, so bear with me. So... To do what we're going to do today, we only need two tools. We need a we need a seven millimeter nut driver, and we need a Torx. I believe this is a T15, and that should be it. So. To get started here, you want to, um, right now I have the car in first gear. So to get started, you want to turn the key in the first click and then put the shifter down into first gear. If you have a 9C1 car and it won't go into first, that's pretty normal. A lot of 9C1 cars have a first gear uh, lockout. This one did too. I removed it. Um, there's two bolts underneath the, uh, underneath the car on the transmission pan that you can remove a bracket from, and that'll allow you to get down to first gear. Um, if you would like instructions on that in a further video, let me know, and I will try to record a quick video on how to uh, re-engage your first gear if you have a 9C1 car. So yeah, if not, second gear is fine. Just put your shifter, make sure your emergency brake's on, okay? Because our key is on, and, our, and we're also putting the car in gear, so it's a really important safety step to make sure that your emergency brake is on. Some people call it a parking brake. And make sure that um, you, maybe your wheels are chalked too if, if, if there's any possibility of the car moving. I'm on a pretty flat uh, garage surface here. It's not going to roll anywhere, but I still set the brake just in case. So, um, we're not even going to be able to take the key out either. So, the key is just going to have to be left in there. Um, if your car dings like this, um, if you pull the key out a little bit, Usually it'll stop dinging. Some cars may or may not. Uh, if that's the case, um, yeah, there's not a whole lot you could do. Um, it'll just continue dinging. Uh, if you turn the key all the way on and leave the cluster on, um, it'll stop dinging on you, but then you'll have power to the cluster, which isn't ideal, but it's not going to hurt anything to do the next couple of steps with it that way. Uh, you can also just remove the dinging module under the dash, or you can just disconnect your battery. And a lot of factory service manuals, uh, their recommendation is always to disconnect the battery anytime you work on a car, uh, dealing with electronics especially. So uh, I'm going to make the same recommendation, but I'm not doing so today on this car. <clears throat> so we got the car in low gear. To get the shifter out of the way, mainly for videotaping really. And uh, I'm also going to tilt the wheel down. So first step is grab your 7 millimeter, Unscrew these two screws up top. If you don't have a 7 millimeter, I believe there's an American size that works. I'd have to go check on that. Um, it's a weird one. It's like 930 seconds or something like that. So give one of those a try if you don't have a 7. Okay, so once you have those two screws out, the, the bezel here has to kind of pop out underneath uh, here. And, you know, this is a good place to grab it. Just be careful of your plastic lens. The, uh, the clear lens here is scratched very easily. So tread carefully around this plastic, clear plastic lens on the gauge. Uh, just try to get your fingers down in there and you can just pop the whole thing forward like that. 
So let me show you again. You just get, kind of try to get your fingers under here and you can just pop the whole thing forward. And then you can just pop it out like this. And how it works is there's these two plastic and metal clips on there. Um, something that happens all the time on these cars is there's a light blocking um, a rubber seal that goes here. Uh, that was long lost on this car many, many years ago. Uh, I made a new one out of rubber hose or some insulation from some sort of wiring. I'm not really sure what that was or is anymore. Um, but it kind of worked, but it still lets some, you can still see some light down through there from the, uh, from the cluster lighting up. Um, a lot of cars are missing this. Um, it's not well attached from the factory. They do fall off very easily. Um, if your car's never been taken apart, uh, you're probably going to end up making that fall off. Um, don't lose it. A lot of times it'll fall down into the steering column down in this area. Just, just look for it. It's, it's going to look like a plat, a rubber, uh, it's going to be more flat than this. This is, like I said, a piece of vacuum hose or, or wire insulation or something. Um, but your stock one looks like a plastic, uh, rubbery skirt that goes on here. And there'll be a U-shaped piece of plastic that snaps over it, that holds it in, that always just falls apart. Um, you know, I might, I might do a future video on how to repair this because I've now since come up with better designs than this rubber hose that's on there now. That was just an, an initial experiment I was doing. So I set this bezel off to the side. <clears throat> and the next step is to remove all these torques around this uh, lens on there. Now, um, if you want to pull the whole entire cluster out, then you need to remove this, this bottom piece. You need to pop this whole bottom piece off the car, and that requires a little bit more work. And also, you know, if you have an older car that has some brittle plastics and things like that, you really don't want to be pulling all this stuff apart um, unless you absolutely have to. Uh, I don't think you have to to do the work that we're going to be doing today. Um, another hang-up, too, if you want to remove the entire cluster out of the car is there is a cable here, right here. Um, hopefully you can see what I'm pointing at. But there's a cable that goes down between the reverse neutral drive uh, pointer, the orange pointer on the cluster. And that cable is what moves the pointer. And it's it can be difficult to detach from the, uh, from the cup or the bowl on the steering column there. Um, it's clipped on underneath the dash. Uh, it's very hard to get access to. You got to take more things apart if you want to get better access to it. Um, I just don't really recommend doing any of that. Um, if you do want to pull the whole cluster out, you can also just lay that off to the side even, and I'll show you what I mean once I get this further apart, and you don't even have to detach it. Um, but it it's kind of gets sloppy. So I just recommend, if you want to service your cluster in the car, I just recommend doing the procedure I'm going to show you today. And that's to remove all these torques. If you have a magnetic torque screwdriver, that might be a better call for this. Um, because these little screws can be frustrating, especially if you drop one down on the dash. So be careful of that. So we'll see how things go as we progress along here. I have a tachometer that's in the way here, this screw. That adds a little bit more of a challenge. You just got to be patient with any of this kind of stuff. Go slowly, take your time. Think about every move you make because there's parts on these cars that can't be easily replaced, especially this plastic, uh, this, this clear plastic. Uh, for years, it was discontinued by GM. I think there's some aftermarket sellers on eBay that may have some. Um, they're not cheap. I think the last price I've seen on those is $70. Um, they're not easy to keep clean either. If you rub them, if you try to clean them by rubbing the dust off with a rag, you will scratch them. You got to be very, very careful with trying to clean them with dust on them. I recommend blowing them off with a uh, air compressor or a canned air before you even attempt to try to clean it with any kind of uh, rag. I've used feather dusters on them before and still left micro scratches. 
Uh, it's just very difficult to clean these. You could see mine might be a little dusty, and to tell you the truth, I'm, not, I'm just going to leave it alone. I'm not going to clean it or anything right now. Um, really, once you have this off, another tip I can give you is to run it under water and don't dry it with a rag. Just shake the water off and let it air dry. Um, or if you do want to dry it with a rag, use a microfiber and don't rub it in. Don't rub it hard. I've also removed fine scratches with um, a good plexiglass polish. And a lot of patience. Okay, I've gotten all the screws out. And now, now the thing wants to just fall out, so I'm going to go ahead and gently remove it. You might also notice, I don't know if it's shown up on camera, but this car also has a door open light on it. I added that. Um, the door open light is up here in the upper right corner. And that light is actually uh, hooked up from the factory. There's just no bulb in there. So you put a bulb in there, your door open light will work. If your car didn't come with the option originally. A little fun fact. So there's a secondary piece that comes out. And that's this guy. Set him off to the side. And then now that'll give you access to your silk screen bezel here. Has all your uh, silk screened. I don't know if that's showing up, but this gives you access to all your silk screened um, check engine lights and things like that. In a future video too, maybe during a reassembly video, I'm going to show you how to clean and polish up these parts too. They're they're nice. If you notice, this one has a nice shiny black, dark black sheen to it. Um, a lot of these. You know, after the car is, you know, 20 years old or so, they'll develop like a gray, you know, dull look to them. And you, you can actually restore that pretty easily. Um, and I'll show you how to do that in a future video. Okay, so next step is this guy. This is what I was talking about here. This is this piece here is a cover and that contains the cable mechanism here that goes down to the bowl for the steering column when you put the car in gear it moves the pointer uh, that is what you can set aside um, if you want to remove this cluster I believe it's been a while since I did, since I needed to do that um, I think yeah I think you have to take the pointer out so yeah I mean you have to kind of weigh whether you want to unhook the cable from the pointer or whether you want to unhook the, the uh, cable from the bowl. Um, in both cases, it's a pain. I honestly like removing the cable from the pointer because um, I think it, it, you don't have to worry about recalibrating it when you put the dash back together. You don't have to worry about fishing your fingers down underneath the dash to hook up the uh, pointer to the bowl. I think it's just a lesser of the two evils. But moving right along... Um, you know, we can actually get these gauges out. And that's really the whole goal of this endeavor is to get these gauges out now. And the gauges, you just, if you notice, I'm just pulling from the back. You pop the back off and then you got to pop the front off too. And let me see if I can find a uh, screwdriver. There she is. Okay. Let's pop off this bottom because what you want to do is you, there's two corner points here. They look like where screws could go. There's two holes in the upper left and the lower right. Um, you want to make sure you apply even pressure to those two points and pull outward. So I, I, that's what I just did here. I don't know how well it showed up. Hopefully it showed up okay. But I applied pressure to that corner in this corner and pull out. And the whole thing just pops right out. And that's how you get access to these gauges. Same goes with the other gauge. That would be your fuel gauge and your oil pressure gauge. Just try prying the corner, top corner, and then again, pop the bottom corner out. Be careful, go slow. If it doesn't want to come like this one's not, don't force it. Kind of just reset yourself. 
go take a sip of coffee if it's fighting you. But whatever you do, don't rush this and don't force things. Okay, there we go. So now that gauge set is out. And if you also notice, I bumped this around. I bumped the, uh, you know, this. Be very careful around this piece too. This is a this is a blue gel filter that's over top of the vacuum fluorescent display. They scratch really, really easily. Just literally rubbing it with your finger or wiping it with a cloth, you're going to scratch it very easily. Um, again, treat it like that, the plastic uh, cluster plexiglass. Treat it like that. It's super soft. Uh, anything you want to wipe it with, just be very cautious um, with what anything you do to it. Uh, I would literally just blow the dirt off of it and call it a day. I wouldn't rub it with anything. I have scratched those. Um, there's even fingerprints on mine, and they're driving me crazy right now. I think I've been seeing those fingerprints for years. I really don't want to mess with it. I just, I'm just going to leave it alone because they scratch so easy. All right, guys. Well, that is, um, that is the process of disassembly. I'll be doing another video. That shows, um, you know, correcting these gauges. You know, this fuel gauge on this car is really loosey-goosey. So I'll be doing another video where I actually refurbish these. Uh, this fuel gauge just doesn't have enough dampening fluid left. It has some, but it's really loose. This oil pressure gauge is just nothing. You know, you shouldn't... Remember I've mentioned in, in my other videos, you shouldn't be able to spin these like this. <laughs> if you can spin them and they spin like a like a propeller, uh, all the dampening fluid's gone. Um, this, this fuel gauge one has some left, so there may not be a whole lot I can do about it. Um, it does bounce around a lot uh, when I'm driving the car, and I just may, I just may have to live with that because it's not totally... There's still enough damp dampening fluid in there, and I'm really not sure I'm going to get a whole lot more dampening out of it, not with the million CST stuff that I have access to. I'd really like to find some 5 million or something thicker and give that a try, but, you know, for now, it is what it is. Uh, this gauge is the temperature gauge, and this one still has some decent dampening left. It's not spinning like a propeller but it is still pretty worn out. So um, I'll definitely be needing to eject some in there. And the fuel gauge or the uh, volt gauge is also bouncing around quite a bit. Um, there's not a lot of dampening left in that. So all these gauges here need a, need a going over with some dampening fluid. Um, and I'll be doing a future video on that whenever I go over these to fix them. I don't want to make this video too long for you guys. Because my next step here is we're going to put this all back together. So there'll be a future video on fixing these and perhaps even calibrating them. Because, you know, they they can use some recalibration after time. Especially if the temperature gauge is, you know, doesn't, doesn't reset to zero. Let's see if this one does. And, of course, this one does reset to zero, so it's fine. Uh, well, cold, I mean. So as long as your needle is resetting to cold, you know, you got to give a little push and it's going right back to the cold point and it's not below cold, it's not above cold, it's right at cold and this car hasn't been driven in over 24 hours, so it's, you know, definitely a, in a cold state. We're good to go. That gauge does not need recalibrated, but it does need some more dampening fluid, so we'll just do that with it. Uh, the volt gauge seems to be reading probably what I would expect. Uh, the voltage on the car is probably around 11 volts, 11 and a half, maybe 12 volts with the key on. Uh, but the engine's not running, so it's going to sit between 11 and 12 volts without the key on uh, with some load on it like this. So I will also go over a way to check calibration on that with a multimeter. And perhaps, you know, readjust it if it needs to, if it's reading too high. Um, sometimes they do bounce. That needle will bounce too, especially when you shut the car off. You know, that needle bounces pretty violently. Is it showing up on camera? But that needle will bounce pretty violently um, down below 8 volts, and it'll hit the peg point on the gauge cluster. Let me review that. Um, these are the peg points 
on these clusters, these little corner pieces here. The needles bang right on those. And after they bang on those a few times, um, it can throw them out of calibration. My 95 Caprice actually has the voltmeter that's out of calibration because of banging like that. And of course, according to my previous videos, the temperature gauges do the same thing. Okay, so re reinstalling the uh, oil pressure. Let me turn the key back. Okay, the key's off. Just wanted to verify before I go plugging things in without the, with the power on. You don't want to do that. Um, oil, oil pressure and fuel gauge, they go in the same way. Just they push, you just kind of lay them over the, over the alignment pins here. There are a couple of alignment pins in the top corners of these. So line them up. You know, don't push hard, just kind of line them up and then just pop it into place. You know, push it into place, drive it, drive it all the way in with your fingers. Just kind of give it a gentle push like, like this. Make sure it's in tight. Um, you know, blow off your, uh, your, your gel here, your uh, blue gel plexiglass there's a little piece of dirt on there i'm trying to push out of the way but i'm probably going to leave fingerprints on it so it is what it is fellas you just got to live with dirt on these um, or be very very careful with cleaning them off those are your two choices and man i just i've cleaned enough of these i just know to leave them alone <laughs> only if they're really dirty clean them but you got to really think about what you're doing as i mentioned so might be do a future video on that kind of stuff if you'd like it let me know and I'll be happy to do so. Now, when you put this, this piece back on, the gauges are all gonna be kind of, a couple of the gauges, especially the volt gauge and maybe the temperature gauge are gonna be out of whack and it's not gonna let you put it on. Again, don't force it. Take your finger and reset all these gauges to the middle position. The volt gauge is spring-loaded, so you're gonna have to hold that one with your finger and gently slip this piece back on. There you go. Put the plastic in internal bezel back on. Sometimes that guy likes to fall back out, but just you can hold it with your other hand and then get your plastic plexiglass cluster cover here. Pardon the dust on mine. Again, like I said, I'm hesitant to clean it. I might clean it in a future video, but for now, we're just going to put it back the way it came. Don't fix it if it ain't broke. Too many times in my life have I not followed that rule. <laughs> I think everybody knows who's worked on cars or anything. Fabrication, computers, electronics. Don't fix stuff that's not broken. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I don't listen to my own rules. But the older I get, the more I'm realizing just leave things alone. It applies to cars. It applies to people. It applies to dogs. Leave them alone. If they want to be left alone. But unlike people and dogs, cars won't let you know when they're hurting. And dogs don't necessarily either, do they? You don't do a good job of it, but that's okay. A good dog owner can usually figure it out if you really, if you really pay attention. People, yeah, sometimes they'll tell you that they're hurting. Sometimes they won't. At least dogs are more predictable. <laughs> right?
I'm not tightening all these up either. I'm putting them all in and just gently, you know, seating them in, but I'm not tightening them just yet. I like to do that last. Of course, I'm putting the worst one in last here by the tachometer. Tricky devil here. Hmm. I had trouble getting it out. And of course I'm gonna have trouble getting it back in. Keep in mind that these threads on these screws are very coarse. You really don't need to turn them a lot to get them fully seated. It'll strip easy if you force them. I purposely just use two fingers, my index finger and my thumb, and I just kind of give it a turn until I feel resistance and I quit there. I don't, you know, I don't grab on it like this and crank these suckers in. You really just want to just do a gentle approach. You know, this one's not seated here, so I got to do a couple more turns. But once it gets seated, you know, don't crank these down. You know, just use a gentle, like I said, thumb and forefinger, thumb and index finger, and that's all she needs. Very, very loose. You know, not loose that it's going to be rattling. You know, make sure it's fully seated, but don't crank these suckers down. Don't want to crack the plastic. You don't want to strip the plastic. We're not holding the wheels on the car here, fellas, or fellets. We're just holding the piece of plastic in place. Take your time. Think about what you're doing. This one's a little trickier because it's behind the tachometer and I really can't get the feel. Of course, your cars won't have a tachometer here, unless you installed one. Okay, I'm just going to kind of go through them all again, make sure I got them all snugged up. I think I missed a few, so I'm just going to go in a circle pattern and hit them all now at this point. I'm not expecting to turn them much. no special pattern either. Just go in a random pattern when you first tighten them down. The head bolts, sure, they need a special pattern. At least that's what the factory tells you. A lot of old timers just tell, you, tell me to go from the inside and work your way out. Start on an inside bolt on a head and just kind of go around and work your way to the outer edges. Some fellas say to do every other bolt. As you're working your way around, things like that. I've heard all kinds of different tricks. The factory service manual tells me to do head bolts in a certain way. That's just what I do. If not, then I just follow the uh, inside out trick and just kind of randomly bounce around, working my way from the inside bolts to the outside bolts. And that's it. Got all those in. What's next? Final bezel. And the final bezel, again, you're going to have this, this seal here on your car. Um, that's, that's the tricky part. You know, it's going to fight you trying to get this in. It's going to be a lot tighter than this one. This one's looser because I made it myself, and I made it loose enough that it's not going to fight me. But if you have a stock car and that seal is still there, um, it's going to kind of fight you here. And you got to make sure you flip it, flip it, you know, kind of tuck it in there and have it facing down into the into the steering column you want to flip it out you want to flip it down in and sometimes you have to get like a screwdriver or a putty knife and just kind of like tuck it down in there uh, I suggest a plastic putty knife or something more plastic because a screwdriver might scratch up your bowl but sometimes that's what you got to do and then you just kind of apply pressure to these bottom two corner points where those plastic clips are and let me uh, refresh your memory on where those clips are I don't mind taking it back out and showing you. There's a clip here, and there's a clip there. 
So that's where you want to apply your pressure when you get this back in. So you want to just give it a little push on the two corners. You'll hear a snap. One snap. The other snap. Make sure the top is in. Top feels good. There we go. That was the click I was looking for. All right, so it's fully seated. And then you just uh, get your seven millimeter, run these up here. Like this. Again, don't crank on these suckers. Again, I like these Craftsman nut drivers. I, you know, when I'm tightening these kind of bolts, I don't want to strip them. I usually grab by the non-knurled section here and just kind of, you know, when your fingers slip on it and you're giving it a lot of pressure, it's tight. You go any tighter than that, you're going to strip things out. I'll just recheck these for tightness. Yep, they're good. And uh, start putting things back to the way they belong car back in the park, turn your key all the way off, take your key out. Let me readjust my tachometer here so that it's facing the proper direction. Then let's try turning the key back on and making sure that all the gauges do what they're supposed to do. Then again, with the car not running, it's not really going to tell me much, but peace of mind. Don't want any surprises the first time I go to take the car for a drive and the, tomorrow morning. Yep, everything looks good. All the gauges are doing their thing. The oil pressure reset back down to low. Volt gauge is reading, you know, probably what looks to be about uh, 11 and a half volts, 12 volts. Temperature gauge is reading perfectly on cold. Fuel gauge is full. full. I got a full tank on this. I ain't that broke. <laughs> All right, folks, that concludes today's video. I will be making more videos in this series, as I promised. I will be showing refurbishment of these particular gauges with the 1 million CST dampening fluid. I'll be injecting them into all these gauges. So I'll show that procedure. That'll be another video, and I won't probably show the disassembly again um, since we've already seen that now. And I will also show some recalibration procedures. All right. Thanks again for watching. Hope this was helpful. See you next time.